Good morning. My name is Marta Correa and I'm going to talk to you about the activities developed for young people regarding the NECTEC project as a way to promote fisheries without litter. Ghost fishing is a term given to the continued fishing by fishing gear that has been lost or abandoned in the aquatic habitat. This problem often comes to us through graphic images of various marine animals trapped in these nets in the ocean. These images represent some of the impacts and destructive potential of the loss and abandonment of fishing gear at sea. At a time when marine litter is one of the biggest world's concern, NECTEC project aims to reduce and prevent marine litter derived from fisheries by working directly with fishers. To achieve this objective, NECTEC uses an integrative preventive approach to reduce lost gear by using new technologies to localize and recover lost gears and promote better practices on board regarding management of fishing waste. Complementing NETEC's work, awareness activities for the younger community, including children and young relatives of fishers, were developed. The activities included lectures on the problematic of ocean pollution, namely pollution to, due to marine litter and particularly plastics and ghost gears, several experimental activities related to the presence of plastics in the marine environment, in sediments, water or even animals, and identification of different types of plastic as an alternative to common plastic to perceive and understand its properties and advantages. Didactic, didactic games addressing topics relevant to fisheries, such as the necessity of preserving healthy and productive oceans and the need to prevent ghost fishing gears. And also a visit to a research center, in this case CMAR, to learn about the research developed in the field of marine and environmental sciences to contact directly with researchers and scientists promoting the interest of the youngest by these scientific areas while learning about the importance of the work developed by these researchers. As a method to evaluate the performance of the activities to do awareness of the youngest, Regarding the need to protect the ocean and to prevent marine litter from fisheries, a questionnaire was made to the teachers whose students participated in the awareness activities. The questionnaire had a basic demographic data questions and also other questions based on items with a liquor scale response. The awareness activities took place in a school of Vila do Conde, a city in the north of Portugal. The school was chosen because it is inserted in an area with a native fish community and a relevant cultural fisheries heritage, which we thought it was the ideal area to implement these activities. On the total of all four types of activities developed, we had 400 participant students who belonged to the first cycle of basic education, covering students from the first year to the fourth year of basic education. In the awareness activities also participated the teachers of their students on a total of 16 teachers. Now I'm going to show you some of the results of the questionnaires made to the 16 teachers who participated in the awareness activities. One of the questions presented in the questionnaire was regarding the importance of this type of collaboration with schools. Most teachers, with a percentage of 69%, agreed that these collaborations with scientific research projects are very important to schools. But when concerning the local importance of this collaboration, especially regarding this NECTEC project, the percentage of teachers who choose the option very important was higher, 88%. Regarding the importance of the topics covered with awareness activities, topics such as ghost gears and marine litter and plastic pollution, most teachers choose the option very important in the relation to both topics. However, the topic related to marine litter and plastic pollution had a slightly higher percentage of 88% regarding the very important answer option when comparing to the 75% answers 
on a very important answer option when regarding the topic of ghost gears. In these next two graphics, we analyze the importance for the teachers of the three types of activities performed, hands-on activities, talk or lectures, and guided tours to research centers, museums, etc. And also, between these three types of activities and what will be the most uh, important activity for the students in the opinion of their teachers. Teachers consider that the most important activity for them would be the guided tours to the research center or museums, with 69% on the very important answer options, followed by the hands-on activities with 50% 50% on both important and very important answer options. On the other hand, when regarding students, the teachers consider that the students will give more importance to the guided tours with 56% on the very important answer options and 38% on the important answer option, followed by the hands-on activities also with 56% on the very important answer option, but with 31% on the important answer option. Talks or lectures was the activity that was considered to be of moderate importance, especially regarding students, with 56%. As teachers consider talks to be important or of moderate importance, with 54% and 38% respectively. On this slide, we can see that the majority of teachers, 81%, responded that they totally agree on the importance of promoting ocean literacy in school activities and school curriculum. And the rest, 19% of the teachers agreed. Regarding the activities carried out with the students, the majority of teachers, 56%, agreed that these activities allowed students to acquire new knowledge. The rest, 44% of the teachers, totally agree that these activities allowed students to acquire new knowledge. Still, in relation to the activities carried out, most of the teachers, 69%, totally agree that the activities contributed to develop, developing participants' awareness of the interconnection with the ocean and the need to protect it. On the other hand, 25% agreed that six and 6% moderately agree that the activities contributed to developing participants' awareness of the interconnection with the ocean and the need to protect it. Now, as a conclusion, we can say that the questionnaire results show that the activities increased awareness on marine litter problematic and ocean pollution on the participants, students and teachers. These activities were also important as a way to raise their ocean literacy and reinforce the engagement of young generations of fishers to adopt better practices regarding fisheries and marine litter. Thus, this type of awareness activities should be promoted to help engage future generations to the ocean pollution problematic and the necessity to protect our oceans, and will contribute to increase the number of responsible citizens with the power to make informed decisions on important subjects as ocean health and conservancy. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm available to answer your questions now. Thank you. So, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed my presentation. Thank you, Marta. I think it's been very interesting. I think our public at the moment is very shy. <laughs> anything in the chat. But I think it's very interesting to see the results of this type of questionnaires. Because I think, in my opinion, I would like to know yours. Many of our activities, our communication activities, we don't have uh, indicators of how they have worked. So I would like to know if this is my question, my personal question, if in your question you, include, you included or in your survey you included a question about what they knew before 
you started to do this kind of activities with them? Uh, yes, that's one approach that we might follow. It's kind of difficult to understand what they knew before uh, uh, and to know if they have increased their knowledge at the end. So we need to do a questionnaire before and the questionnaire after the activities. In some of our activities, some of previously activities, we have done that. Uh, here we only have done a questionnaire at the end of the, the activities and only to the teachers. Uh, but sometimes it's very hard to get the correct amount of knowledge that they have uh, learned because uh, it's different the knowledge that they have uh, the right at the time at the end of the activities and maybe some weeks or maybe a month later do that knowledge maintains or they have forgotten what they learn so it's uh, it, the idea would be to do a follow-up uh, to know if that the the knowledge has uh, was really built onto them and sometimes it's kind of difficult to do it oh, okay thank you Thank you. So if we don't have any questions, we are really good on time. Um, maybe you're going to stay here, Marta. Yes, maybe of course. We will have a questions and answer, and maybe we could have some time of debate, OK? Thank you for your presentation. And now let's go to the second one. I'm leaving the floor to Kasha Drumgrigan. I hope <laughs> I'm saying correctly. Her talk is My Spurious Seashore Guide Workbook. So the floor is yours. Thank, thank you. you. Good. Right, thank you um, for having me today, and it's great to um, be able to um, speak to everyone. Um, about the Explorers Education Program and um, a publication that we um, created this year called My Explorer's um, Seashore Guidebook. I'm going to take you through the process of how we, cr um, the, we created the book and um, looking at the barriers to teaching ocean literacy um, in primary school um, education and, ha and how we overcame these barriers um, through developing the book and um, also how we sort of used um, methods of communication um, strategy to, um, strategies to um, to promote the book. So um, first of all, um, the Explorers Education Program um, is funded by the Marine Institute, which is um, the Marine Institute is a state agency responsible for marine research and development in Ireland. Um, one of its key actions is to inspire a new generation of ocean champions and inform society of the value of Ireland's marine resource and the importance of our ocean and the work of the Marine Institute. And this is partly achieved through um, the Explorers Education Program, um, which Camden Education Trust is responsible for the strategic management and development. Um, and we also have a team of outreach and um, support services who are also funded by the Marine Institute throughout Ireland um, supporting the program. Now, our goal is to engage with primary school children, teachers, and the education network, um, creating marine leaders and ocean champions. Um, our aim is to achieve this through adopting ocean literacy principles and concepts, and where um, we aim to develop a, an ocean literate children who understand the importance of the ocean, um, ha have the ability to communicate about the ocean in a meaningful way and therefore are able to make um, informed and responsible decisions. So with um, looking at barriers to teaching ocean literacy in the classroom, um, I, I've worked in uh, marine um, science communications for over 15 years and have been involved in um, advising um, EU projects on communications and outreach and have also done um, research of my own looking at the barriers to teaching ocean literacy in um, primary school um, in Ireland. And there's a number of different barriers that have come up which are quite um, uh, interestingly interlinked. Um, first of all, when we're looking at the um, barriers with for scientists, more and more scientists are expected to um, have um, 
a certain percentage of their time and resources allocated to um, comms and outreach to get the fund um, to get their funding. And um, some of the barriers that the scientists come up with are that they have a generally have a lack of understanding of what educators and communicators are needing to um, to be able to share their story, the type of content that is required. Um, there's also the lack of time and um, to create content that um, a lack of time and also financial resources to create specific content for different stakeholders. Often there's the approach that one box fits all and um, where we can, how can we create content that can cover a multitude of different stakeholders. Um, and often what, by doing this, this um, doesn't actually reach the intended target audiences and, and has a low impact. Um, and then there's also the issue of um, evaluation and failing to include both the quantitative and qualitative data. So it's not just about collecting data on numbers, but it's also looking at behavioral changes. And, and as I mentioned before, the barriers for teachers is very similar in that their, one of their main barriers to teaching ocean literacy in the classroom is actually having fit for purpose content um, and educational resources that are suitable for the age group and are suitable for the um, curriculum. Um, there, there's also the lack of accessibility of resources, whether it's um, a lot of content is just put up online, whereas um, teachers often don't have the financial resources all the time to be looking for content online or printing um, content. And then there's also um, applicable resources in, in suitable languages um, for different countries and different, um, like in Ireland, obviously, we have Irish and English. Um, and then there's also teachers will often comment about um, their lack of knowledge about the marine, but often this can be do more to do about their own confidence um, in teaching. So um, with the, that in mind, we wanted to, to um, create ocean champions through ocean literacy and SDGs. So one of the things that we have um, looked at is having a really clear understanding of what the teacher's requirements are and having a really um, clear understanding of the actual curriculum um, and how research projects can actually fit into school subjects. Um, for example, in Ireland, there isn't actually, marine isn't actually formally on the curriculum. So we've had to look outside the box and um, see how we can introduce marine through the subjects such as science and geography, um, English and maths and so forth. Um, and also having an understanding of the curriculum is also understanding how the government um, strategy and the education department of education strategy um, sees um, how subjects are taught. And within Ireland, there's a strong emphasis on teaching through um, the SDGs. So for example, the Sustainable Development Goal 14, which is um, under, you know, under life underwater, is um, an opportunistic um, for being able to teach all things marine um, through the various different subjects. So what we um, have done then with the development of the book was that we um, wanted to create a book that was fit for purpose. Um, so we the book in itself has been designed to provide children the op opportunity to actively um, engage in the learning process um, about the marine. And this um, is based on um, the different subjects of science, English and art and maths. Um, so for example, through science, it's teach, the teaching methodology of observation, um, exploration and discovery are adopted throughout the book. Um, the book also focuses on subject strands. And so, um, so for example, under science, we would have living things. So children um, are learning about the animals, their habitats, and also learning about environmental awareness and um, care. And so part of that would be the children are documenting their experiences on the seashore and the human impacts on the seashore. And um, then through English, they're learning through new words um, about the, spe you know, the species names from English names, the Irish names and the um, science Latin names. Um, and then through art, the children are learning to um, do scientific drawing, drawing 
but also using um, their creative um, artistic skills as well and coming up with solutions on how to um, improve human impact on um, their seashore um, um, environment. Um, one of the things that we also did before we actually published the book was actually we put it through a trial process with um, teachers through teachers training and also through outreach um, training. And one of the things with the book highlighted the importance of having a book that was um, usable with before going to the seashore and after the seashore and the practicality of having a book on the seashore um, and keeping it sort of like keeping it into a point where it was sort of like this book like scientists going out to sea to research not all research is done at sea on a research vessel you often it's sort of like you have your pre and your post research um, um, activities so that similarly the book is used in that used in that approach um, we also wanted to make sure that the book was accessible uh, most in Ireland most um, children would be using um, have workbooks which are um, published by formal educators um, teachers also don't have, as I mentioned, don't have time to print um, a lot of things online. So we wanted to make the book um, sure the book was um, available online. So we made it freely available on the Marine Institute's open access repository. Um, and so within the first month of the book being published, it was downloaded 857 times, which is, is a quite a um, great um, first blast for, for the book. Um, we also printed over 2,000 copies of the book, which are available for uh, citizen science projects as well as um, our um, teachers resource, um, as a teacher's resource for teachers training and for our outreach um, teams who would use the books in, um, as part of the projects and onshore um, seashore safaris. Um, the book was promoted through a dedicated series of um, media activities. Um, first of all, obviously, the, with generating a press release, um, we distributed that via um, various different media contacts through our local trade press and, um, and national press and radio. Um, the story around it was... Um, was published on um, International Biodiversity Day, which um, gave it sort of a, itself its own momentum. But it was also published um, with the idea that we wanted to create that story of people connecting with the um, connecting with the ocean. And obviously, with the time of, um, that we're in, we're leading into summer where we were um, still in lockdown in Ireland. So there was the opportunity there about people weren't necessarily going to be traveling overseas. So there was that opportunity to remind people about um, learning about what's on their doorstep. And with over half the population um, living five kilometers from the seashore in Ireland, this was a perfect opportunity for um, pro promoting marine education. And um, interestingly, talking to a number of the um, media it became quite evident about that whole issue, the whole sort of element of storytelling and connecting and having that emotional connection with the ocean, which links to the idea that for us to be able to really value the ocean and the seashore, we need to be able to, um, we need to be able to see it and touch it and smell it and taste it and feel it. And obviously with the seashore, there's no better way to um, get those sort of experiences. Um, the book has also um, been used for our outreach um, in schools and um, for teachers training, as mentioned before. So with, um, our, through our outreach, we deliver um, seashore safaris and also marine projects. And um, in the school year, it is estimated that we'll be reaching approximately 8,000 children. Now we've I've had to adapt our methods of delivery to now include blended learning, but um, there's also the opportunity of outdoor education, which um, is in the importance of actually teaching out outdoors. So it, um, again, it lends to, um, obviously with the pandemic has lent to other opportunities for the Explorers Program and, and how we actually reach the children. Um, as mentioned too, we also have um, engaged through citizen science. So well, one of the objectives of the, um, 
of the book was to create a um, create pages which allowed or engage with um, citizen science activities and a project that or an initiative that is called Explore Your Shore um, works with the National Biodiversity Data Centre where people are able to take photos and document their um, species that they find in different shores around, the, um, around Ireland. And um, the Explore Your Shore engagement in the last year has increased by 107% um, percent with public engagement, which obviously um, the collaborating with um, us with the um, publication of this book has, has um, contributed to, to those figures. Um, so finally, one um, with the program, what we'll also be doing is with the book in the Explorers program is that is looking at the evaluation of um, how this book has been um, used and also children's knowledge and awareness and linking back to the ocean literacy um, concepts and principles and um, and also their understanding and um, engagement and the way that we actually do that with the explorers education program is that we do a pre and post evaluation so when we're running our modules with the schools we would do a pre knowledge um, questionnaire and then we do a post um, knowledge questionnaire after the um, after the actual module delivery but we also look at the actual types of projects that have been created um, with the modules. So there's a qualitative um, element of um, evaluation where the teams will be looking at how the ch children have engaged, what they're communicating and their decision making and, how, um, and types of solutions that um, they're forming with um, being responsible citizens and, um, going, and being ocean champions. So that um, we feel that it's sort of like the book in itself. We hope, hopefully, we'll be sort of meeting some of those targets as well. So that um, is my. Um, I'm. Um, that's the. <laughs> hopefully, that um, will give you some inspiration and some ideas on um, how to sort of how to um, deliver outreach and um, communications concepts. With your, um, with your with your organizations as well. So I'm open for questions. Okay, thank you, Gosha. I'm still saying that our public is very shy. <laughs> I, I have to, so for me, it's been incredible. I think it's a fantastic idea. I think the book is brilliant. So I. I uh, maybe I, I will copy it to do something. <laughs> well, it's for it's free, so you can download it and oh, use. It. But, but maybe I will write to you to yeah. to to ask you for some help. Uh, I would like to ask you how many scientists, because I am a, a marine scientist and I I'm really involved in communication. But I totally agree with what you said with the problems we face. To as being a uh, a scientist, you don't have time. Maybe your job is not well evaluated. If you do some communication, or it seems like you are losing, you wasting your time. Um, but in my opinion, I would like to know how many scientists have helped to you, have helped you to do this this work, this book, or have been involved, or or if they haven't. <laughs> Um, well, with working with the Marine Institute, um, so I had worked for, before I worked with Camden Education Trust, I worked at the Marine Institute for over 15 years. And part of the process of um, part of the communications, my communications role was developing the Explorers Education Program. So we had scientists at hand um, who were always there to um, contribute to um, resources that were being developed. And one of those, I suppose, the working in communications is that you become that sort of middle pillar of you know, communicate how to sort of get scientists to communicate their stories and their information and their research, and um, but also communicating that and making sure that it's factually correct. Um, and that it's not, so when you're working with the media or you're working with educators, that stories or information isn't doesn't become um, diluted um, with facts. So there's always that there's always scientists on hand, and I'm very fortunate to be working um, and funded by an organisation where there are 
um, scientists who are specialists in different fields who are more who have access to. So, um, so that was part even just with you know, developing the book in itself. It's very much about the book is designed in a way that it's very much about um, children um, being act actively engaged in the learning process. So not all the answers are in the book, but it sets up the framework and the scientific framework for observation and exploration and discovery. So it's learning about the principles of science and, and scientific research and how to do it. No. Okay. Thank you. I think I repeat myself, oh, it's a very good idea. I think it's very practical. I think it should be very useful to bring the science to, to their homes. Um, and I always yeah. say the same, because we live near the, the shore. I live in Malaga, the south of Spain, but we live back to the sea. So we have to look to the sea. Then our, our, our eyes there, and maybe this would be a very good tool to do that. Thank you. And it's very true to Ireland as well, is that as an island nation, um, it's, there's a, say, a similar saying where we look to the, you know, we have our backs to the sea, but, um, and often in the summertime, the, you know, there's a lot of people who will go overseas to the warmer countries for, you know, particularly for, you know, during the summer. So this year actually provided an opportunity where um, there was a lot more activity and engagement um, with what can we do at home. And the media were really quick to um, engage with that concept, and um, which was um, it was opportunistic in a, in a way. But it's um, but I suppose that's part of communications as well is looking is having an understanding as to what the general sort of feel and environment is um, in the wider community, and and linking in with those stories and and people's um, you know. What people are sort of what people are talking about outside the outside our scientific and communications bubble. Yeah. In those links. Yeah. Okay. Many thanks, Goshla. Thank you. So now um, we are going to leave the floor to Mariola Norte Navarro. She's from Spain as me. And as Goshla, could you please stop sharing your screen? Thank you. Mariola is talking us about communicating the unexpected when climate change is not to blame. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Carmen. It's a pleasure to be here today. And well, um, it, I will introduce a little bit myself. I work in Fundación Setmar, which is a public firm foundation working to improve the marine environment. We are in the northwest of Spain, in Vigo, in the city of Vigo. And we work as knowledge uh, brokers. Um, well, and this means that we mediate in between the scientific community, the industry, and the policy and decision makers. So this is our role. And well, after more than 10 years of experience working in the, in, with this role, we have to face a new challenge that came uh, nearly five years ago in the shape of an H2020 project, which is called a Climbfish Project, looking to effective adaptation to climate change in fisheries and aquaculture sectors. And well, in this project, we had 16 case studies from all those three sectors, uh, fisheries, marine fisheries, lake and ponds, and um, aquaculture uh, from different countries uh, along Europe. But the novelty here was that we had to deal with the uncertainty of climate change and the long-term scenarios, which, well, uh, the sectors were not very comfortable with. Right, so we have also to involve the stakeholders in, in this project, we have to interact with them in eight of the case studies. But today, I will go through four of these cases to uh, present our experience, our communication experience with facing the unexpected. So, in this project, what we, were, uh, what we did first was to identify the key players. In this case, we have the industry representatives and fishers, the policymakers, advisory bodies, NGOs, external scientists, but of course, the project researchers. 
and we developed communication strategies adapted to each of these targets and each of the cases. Right, so to facilitate uh, to facilitate this uh, process, we developed the stakeholder half, which was an adaptive and flexible platform to facilitate the production of knowledge and the uptake of results in a multi-level um, uh, networking. And uh, we have to work with a participatory approach in order to involve the stakeholders and to get realistic results, all right? so. Um, we also have to develop an internal communication strategy with the project researchers. We have different profiles, different disciplines, from biology to uh, social scientists, economists, and we were in the middle of that, trying to get the best of their knowledge to translate it or make it or digest it for the stakeholders in order to make them uh, make it understandable and to engage them and manage to get their uh, participation in the project. We count with a wide range of communication channels, like online, off, on, off light, offline channels, and we utilize like almost all of them. We have uh, also meetings with a face-to-face -face meeting with with the stakeholders, where we where we presented our results and managed to get their participation. So well, I will go through through the first examples. We are now back to Galicia. And here, we, this is the story of our experience with the muscle producers. Um, well, in this, we have a meeting with them and with uh, local authorities and also as uh, regional scientists in which we were going to raise awareness of climate change because with our first interaction with them before this meeting, we, we, we guess that they weren't aware of the potential impacts of climate change. So, well, in this, in this meeting, something unexpected occurred. We found that in spite of our previous interaction with them, they were very concerned about climate change. And uh, they wanted the scientists to find a solution in that meeting. And this reaction came because um, they had an experience in the previous summer to this meeting. It was the average uh, tem temperature was higher than normal. And that's, uh, well, that uh, generated a, a negative uh, situation for them. The production wasn't very good as expected. And they thought they blamed climate change for that. But well, that was just a singular event. And um, we need to prove if this was related or not to climate change. So we found they weren't concerned about long-term climate change impacts. And in that meeting, we have to commit to find out if those impacts that they have identified were climate change related and come back to them in order to disentangle these impacts uh, for uh, different reasons other than climate change. Well, it, that was a difficult situation and we managed to, to convince them to contribute in this project, to keep working on this, providing the, the, the results and feedback. And the next time we met with them, well, they were like more quiet. They had a very good season of culture season and they weren't so concerned about climate change. And we managed to clarify that that event was a singular event and some of the risks they identified weren't uh, related to climate change while other ones were. So we included this in our adaptation plan that we managed to develop together with them. In the next example, we are going to the north of Italy, to the Lake Garda. And here, as in the previous example, our aim was to raise the awareness of climate change. But before that, we have to convince them to participate in the meeting, because in this case, they didn't consider climate change to be a problem for them. So they weren't so, uh, well, um, they, they, they didn't want to participate in the meeting at, at the beginning. 
So thanks to some of the project researchers located in, 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 in Italy, uh, we uh, developed a strategy in which um, uh, a media day was set and that was a way to engage the stakeholders because, well, they thought if the press is going to go to that event, we are going to gain visibility and that was good for them, but also for the project. And in the end, it has a lot of repercussion in the local and regional uh, press and the Sorry, they also appeared in television. But what is best is that we managed uh, to raise awareness about the impact of climate change in Lake Garda. And even more, uh, a new network was created. They are concerned now about the impact of climate change they weren't aware of. And they have started a new network they have got new funding beyond this project to keep working on a specific project for them. The next example, it, it leads us to uh, the west of Scotland fisheries. And here um, I bring this example because, well, when it's the beginning of the project and you don't have results to show to your stakeholders or to share with them, but you still have to feed the connection with them. So you have to be with your open eyes and find out uh, content of, or information that might be relevant for them. And that was the case. We found a report that was pu published in ISIS and we sent it to one of our stakeholders, a policymaker from Marine Scotland. And well, this report came to the right person in the right moment that made him remind about our project and it was included in the Scottish Climate Change Adaptation Program in 2017. So here is the example of how the hub is working, connecting the dots. And the last example I bring here today, it refers to our experience in Hungary with the Ponce Aquaculture. As in the other examples, we have a meeting with the stakeholders. Uh, that meeting was in service with the uh, local producers uh, of pond aquaculture. And well, at the beginning, we were concerned about the language barriers because none of them spoke in English. We only have one of the researchers, which was Hungarian, leading the meeting and also some support with, with the support of translators that made uh, feasible to explain our results from the different disciplines, from the social scientists and also from the web developer in the project. Well, we, we were concerned because we thought that maybe stakeholders would feel observed or intimidated with our presence with foreign people in there just watching and not speaking. But against what we thought, the reaction was so surprising because anytime they they, they spoke, they stand up and talk to the translator and ensure that their message reach us. And this make them feel like important, listened by foreign people who came from all over Europe just to listen to their needs and problems. So, well, here it is the bubble tower in which we finally overcome the language barrier. So what have worked in this eclectic context? So first of all, our experience tells that we have to keep working with traditional communication strategies to develop communication plans. It's so important to keep working and using the public relation tools, even though we have the new technologies. These, these are included, but we don't have to forget the traditional tools and also to keep growing the personal relationships. Here also, it was so important trust building as in the example in Galicia, we were honest, we uh, reached a commitment and we contribute to build trust with our stakeholders. We also practice the practice listening, which has been so important in here. And we designed and developed customized strategies and we have been flexible all over the project. We also have different channels for multi-directional communication within here in a participatory process. It's so important. And then in climate change, always communicate the uncertainty. 
But one of the important things is that you need the role of the knowledge brokers with a communication profile or background and also scientific knowledge in order to deal with all the different disciplines, scientists uh, that we have within the project. But one of the most important things we learn is that we have to be ready for the unexpected. So what we got, we managed to have more than 150 participants from all these three sectors and the, we have them contributing and uh, participating in development of more than 80 adaptation measures. So this project shows that we were able to get actionable science. We raised the stakeholders awareness of climate change with local, regional and national impacts. We found scientific research thanks to stakeholders participation and that gave them ownership and accountability about adaptation. This created new networks and more relevance in the socio-political context. So it was very important that high impact and improvement of a stakeholder engagement was accomplished in here. So just to conclude, the importance of knowledge broker aspects here is needed. As I mentioned, to have this profile of a communicator or communication background with scientific knowledge in order to be able to speak at least part of the scientific language is so important. Then internal communication is crucial in scientific projects. We found this is very well implemented in the corporations, but when, when, we, when we move to scientific projects, internal communications usually start and ends with an intranet or with a SharePoint. So this is not enough. We need to develop the strategies to address our targets in order to get the best of them and to reach the stakeholders or the targets for the, uh, which are gonna use our results. And then bring adaptation beyond climate change. This is our lesson learned. And um, thank you very much for listening and I'd be happy to respond to any of the questions. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mariola. Great presentation. I love this comic at the end, the Patea. <laughs> I think it's really interesting. We don't have any questions in the chat, but I think your presentation um, arises a, a problem that we are facing now is the new ways of communication. So maybe we can relate it to the COVID-19. We are in a different world. Your, your meetings and your were during the 2017, you said that the first one, mm -hmm. the last years and things has, has changed a lot. What would you have done if your meetings were programmed by this moment? For example, for me, it's been really interesting what happened in Galicia with the bateas, with the muscles. Because I work in the climate change group and I, I'm very used to, to listen to people saying, this is climate change, this is climate change, and it's not. So the way you communicate and you this, they, they saw that the problem was different one year from the, uh, the next one, maybe this, this fact will be different if we were in this year. What would you, you have done in that case? Well, here, this is a thing we are now dealing with because we are trying, as you know, as, as I was explaining, we, we have interaction with the stakeholders and personal face-to-face -face interaction are very important. And in this year, this is something that we couldn't have, uh, that it wouldn't happen in this year. So we are trying to develop um, being to be creative about new strategies to approach and reach the stakeholders. At a local level, maybe it's easier because you can pick up the form and if you have a previous relation with them, you can have an interview or, or, or get information from them in this way. But of course, the um, personal uh, or face-to-face -face communication is so important. And this is something we are dealing with in, in, in our um, department because we need to find new ways to approach the stakeholders right now. 
Yeah. And I think another really interesting point of your presentation is been about the Hungarian pounds. What you said about they feel comfortable because they were being heard. I think the importance of being heard is more is bigger than we expect. Yeah, it's, it's, that was a very funny situation because, as I mentioned, we were concerned about well, they are going to feel like. Um, uh, they, they are being observed, all these foreign people looking at them, not speaking, but that was just the opposite. It's like they, they felt honored because we went to their, their hometown to listen to their needs and problems. And sometimes um, this is so basic that sometimes we forget about this. And we cannot forget about this, about people. Maybe at local level, it works better or with people who has no previous experience with this kind of projects. But well, it's something we cannot forget that in the end, people wants to be listened. And, and they it also, of course, there are the cultural differences and it's not the same everywhere. But you, you need to do some research. You have to... Uh, find the different ways to approach them, but of course, never forget to listen to what people is saying and and how you can you can help. Yes, totally. Well, we have now questions in the chat for you. Thank you, Mariola, Mariola for the presentation. The media day is a great idea to engage with groups that are not interested. I oh, sorry, in a meeting workshop. What do you consider to be the optimum time limit for this meeting? A day, a half of a day? This is important. Well, uh, it it varies, you know. Um, in some cases, we have half a day meeting. For example, if you have to meet people who is uh, leaving their, their work that day to meet with you, they have obligations to deal with. So maybe half a day should be enough. But some, uh, sometimes, uh, well, that's the, the, the average, half day or, or a day including lunch. And this will depend on the country, the culture, or who are you um, interacting with and how are the agenda. For example, with policymakers, you can arrange a meeting and have them for lunch. But maybe in this case with the mass producers, maybe they only have one morning available to to meet so each situation needs to do specific research okay and we have another tricky question for you <laughs> if you could have to face the same situation now and european project is there something you would do different differently well for sure <laughs> <laughs> i would do many things differently First, because now I have this experience with them. And now with the present situation, um, you have no choice but to do things differently. Maybe you will have to find a different connection points. Uh, here we have all centralized in, in, in Setmar, uh, all the interaction with the stakeholders, but maybe you need to find li liaisons with other countries to to at least develop a part of your work or what would you do if you were able to be there? Okay, thank you. And um, now we have only five minutes left. I would like Mata to switch on her camera if she is here. So we have a common question for you. You have some said something similar, Mariola. It is related to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's a similar question for to all the presenters of commotion. The online presence of marine science activities has, has increased considerably, but there's currently an online fatigue. Do you think this is the this is this has reduced the impact of our activities? Are there too much, too many activities? Uh, uh, thank you so much. From my experience, uh, uh, we used to mainly work uh, directly with students or say uh, hands on activities. Uh, being not able to do so right now, we have changed to the most our online activities. And yes, I, I've been noticed uh, from the beginning of this pandemic, there's been an increase of um, 
online activities from various sectors. So although there might be some kind of fatigue, we may also say that it's important because teachers and educators have now access to a variety of online activities and online materials that they probably didn't have before or they were not so uh, easily available. So there might be a negative effect, but there's also a positive effect. So, uh, yes. Okay, thank you, Marta. You, Kashla? You're welcome. No. Oh, thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, similar to Marta, we, um, the whole, this year has been an extraordinary year of challenges, but also opportunities. And um, interestingly, with children, um, the, one of the problems in Ireland is, um, is accessibility to online um, content. Um, for some schools and even for people, you know, particularly during lockdown when parents were teaching from home. So there were, we were having to think outside the box of how to actually reach children and parents and teachers um, without actually depending on um, online content. So I think in, um, it sort of prepared us for going back into back to school in 20, you know, the sort of new school year of 2020, 21, on how we're developing content that um, is blend, more from a blended learning experience. So it's how to produce content that um, you can get online, but you might be sending content um, through, um, through USB keys where video pre-videos are recorded, um, you know, down on the seashore. Um, we're creating content where um, children can actually use, go, you know, have online access, but also have um, printed content um, delivered to the schools as well. So um, I suppose in some ways we're addressing fatigue, but um, the experience also coming from the outreach teams is that, and I think they were very nervous about going online where a lot of them hadn't done online um, teaching before, was that children like to talk and it comes back to they like to be listened to as well. And um, having that opportunity of talking to someone um, via the internet um, is a huge um, bonus and plus for them. So there's been some really positive um, opportunities there as well. Um, I think there is a lot of fatigue from an adult education in the sense of um, where we, are, we have so much availability and access now to conferences and to webinars and um, learning opportunities that um, I think sometimes there is that need of, we really are looking forward to getting that face-to-face contact again okay you want to, to add anything else Mariela? well i agree with them in, because well you have the positive and negative things but here i can only highlight the positive things like in congress is like this one uh, it's uh, an opportunity to democratize the science to make it accessible and um, I have the experience to participate in other country, uh, congress in which they have the mixed uh, participation like uh, online but also uh, the uh, presential par participation and it's an open door that we have and I think we shouldn't go back because this is something that has started and many scientists and researchers sometimes the agendas or the, um, uh, the, there are uh, some limitation with the money to travel. And this is a very great opportunity that we should keep. At least you have the, the both uh, participation options for everyone. Okay, thank you. We are just in time. I think it's been a great session for the, so many thanks to all the three, to the people who are being hearing us. And so um, now you have to continue with your with the scheduled con Congress. And um, many thanks. See you soon.